Good morning, everyone. Are we good? Are we on? Am I good? Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're great. We're here. We made it through February. And we're here. And it's March and spring is coming, so I've been told. My name is Gordon Ritchie. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Uh, Karen Mills and I will be your service leaders this morning. Uh, we are also the co-conductors of our church choir, Coriolis. Our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison, is off today, and she'll be back with us again next Sunday. We begin our gathering this morning acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Our theme for the month of March is transformation. Karen wrote the following blurb about our service this morning. Every day we cross thresholds, real and imagined, that can change how we view and relate to the world around us. Each time we change, we add to the layers of experience we accumulate over our lives, deposits of joy and sorrow on the foundation of who we are. Crossing and changing are just other ways of transformation. Today we examine the, po the uh, possibilities and challenges of transformation. We are one of two Unitarian churches uh, in Edmonton, the other being Westwood Unitarian Congregation. As Unitarian Universalists, we are bound together not by a common set of beliefs, but by our promise to support one another in our individual searches for truth and meaning, guided by our principles and drawn by uh, drawing from many sources. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or online, we hope that you feel welcome here today. Whatever you believe or do not believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, however you identify, whatever your age, race, or ability, you are welcome here. We invite you to join us on a journey of free thought, spiritual questing, and justice making. If you are new here, we invite you to stay for coffee and fellowship following our service. Now I want to tell you a little bit about our prelude this morning. If everything goes well, this, this prelude will become our hymn of the month for March. It is a brand new tune. So with that in mind, the choir is going to sing the first verse and chorus of this brand new tune. Now I need you to pay attention to what's going on because there will be a test at the end of the service and that test is that you will be singing this tune with us with the additional three verses. So now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us let go just for a time of the everyday world. Let us quiet ourselves as well as any electronic devices that you may have with you this morning. Let us create a space in this hour to simply be together in the spirit of life and love we gather.
So that's why I said we're going to see how this works before it becomes the hymn of the month. So thank you for your indulgence. So our opening words this morning are by Adrian Goff. Thresholds. We cross them every day. From room to room, from outside to inside, and back again, from here to there, from anywhere to everywhere, from age to age. Each threshold offers an opportunity for change, for renewal, for transformation, for what we were and what we are to what we can be. In this hour and in this place, we cross a threshold from our day-to-day everydayness into space and time attuned to one another, to the sacred, to the holy, into the awareness of a new life pregnant with possibilities. How will you be renewed in this moment? How will you be changed in this hour? How will you be transformed through this gathering of beloved community? Come, you longing, thirsty souls, Come, let us worship together. There was a shindig here yesterday in our sanctuary, and I love that we have shindigs and whoop de doos and all sorts of extraordinary things in this place where we come together to worship, to celebrate, to honor. We're celebrating at this moment, because I think celebrations like this go on for at least a week, wouldn't you say, Dorothy? And this one certainly, certainly should. We're, we've been celebrating the 90th birthday of a blessed person within our community, Dorothy Keeler. Yay. Yay! And so to honor this celebration, I've asked her niece, uh, Lori, who's been, arrived here from Toronto, to assist us in assisting Dorothy to light our chalice this morning. Before we do that, I offer you these words by Bet. Why next? May this flame, symbol of transformation since the beginning of time, fire our curiosity, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good within and around. All right, everybody give me a ooh. And now give me an ah. Thank you, Lori and Dorothy. It's time for us to sing now. Our opening song uh, is in the Teal hymn books, if you wish, that are at the back of the church. The words will be coming up on the screen behind me. For those of you who are online, the text will be coming up on your screens at home. Even though you're at home, we expect that you will be singing this lustily as... Everyone else in the in here in the sanctuary will be doing the same. It's number 1018. Come with, come and go with me. I invite you to rise in body and spirit as we join together in singing number 1018.
Thanks, everybody. That's a great way to start the service. So we will be having a time to share our abundance. However, this whole month is about transformation and how that affects our lives, affects our community. And so I'll invite Andrew to speak with us now. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andrew Mills, and I am the treasurer and the canvas chair for this church. So first of all, let me start by thanking everyone for their donations. I hope to have the tax receipts for 2023 done later this week. Uh, we've been a little bit caught up with the water damage and roof leaks, so we're just now getting the time to get to, to send these all out. So I apologize for the delay, but they should be coming out shortly. March is Canvas Month, and during Canvas Month, we're going to have a brief talk in church uh, each, uh, each Sunday to talk about some of the things that, that go into Canvas. By the end of this month, all members should return a pledge form estimating their financial support of our church for the coming year. Uh, we'll send you a pledge form uh, if you're a donor with your tax receipt. Uh, there's also forms in the lobby, there's forms in the back of the church, and there is one in the newsletter this month as well. So there's lots of forms around. If you're a member, you need to return a pledge form. Let me say that again. If you're a member of this church, you need to return a pledge form. Your pledges are really important to us because we use these to determine what our church budget will be for the coming year. If we can't establish a budget, it's hard for us to go on. It's hard for us to operate. So your pledges are vitally important for us to be able to determine what we can do in the coming year. This year's, cam uh, this year's theme, Canvas theme, is transformation. Our church is transforming into learning to live in covenant. In the past year, we agreed to the covenant, and now we need to complete the transformation to living in covenant. Our covenant's posted in the lobby. It's on our website. It's included in every newsletter, and it starts like this. With love as our guide, we pledge to create a beloved community of peace and compassion. Now, why am I bringing up our covenant? Because one of the agreements that we agreed to is that we agree to share the ministry of this congregation through our gifts of time, talent, and money. March is the time when we talk about sharing our gifts of money. So please, please, pledge your financial support to our church before the end of the month. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Andrew. And I'm going to continue on that for a little bit. And remind everyone that our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges, and I love that we have that, um, that's a text that comes from our service leader guide. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. For the month of March, uh, we share our abundance with the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women. One half of the unidentified cash that is received this month is given to this organization. And I will ask if I can get a couple ushers to begin collecting the offering at this time. That would be grand. Thank you. And while we're collecting the offering, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this organization. I was on their website last night, and I thought, oh, man, I just started cutting and pasting and cutting and pasting. I thought if, if I continue to talk about all the extraordinary things that this organization is doing, we're going to be here for a little while. But I'm just going to give you a little bit, a little snippet of what this organization does. The UC, sorry, the ICUW advances equity for women and girls throughout the world through leadership development empowerment and awareness programs, advocacy and resources. Led by Unitarian Universalist women from around the world, its members include Unitarian Universalists and other people of liberal religious face. I'm going to give you a couple examples of some of the work that they do. In December of 2014, a formal ag agreement of uh, collaboration was signed between the ICUUW 
and the women's wing of the Unitarian Union of Northeast India. Sessions pre uh, presented focused on topics such as gender roles, gender equity, women's rights, leadership skills, communication skills and effective communication, sexual and reproduction health, violence against women, and economic empowerment and business entrepreneurship. Another item, a week after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the ICUUW launched a large-scale fundraising support to supply immediate assistance to families fleeing war in Ukraine. So that's just the tip of the iceberg of a lot of the extraordinary work that this organization is doing. For those online, I would encourage you to visit either the International Convocation of Women Unitarian Universalist Women website or our UCE website to make a donation. And so we thank you for your generosity and your support. With our time, our talent, and our money, we support the work of our worldwide community and this Unitarian tradition. As we receive the offering, uh, let us join in singing together. From you I receive. I would now like to invite Carol up for our next reading. Hi, my name is Carol Hutchings, and I'm going to read a prayer for Desert Times by Margaret Keep. The journeys of our lives are never fully charted. There come to each of us deserts to cross, barren stretches, where the green edge in the horizon may be our destination, or an oasis on our way, or a mirage that beckons only to leave us lost. When fear grips the heart, or despair bows the head, may we bend as heart and head lead us down to touch the ground beneath our feet. May we scoop some sand into our hands and receive what the sand would teach us. It holds the warmth of the sun when the sun has left our sight as it holds the cool of the night when the stars have faded. Hidden amongst its grains are tiny seeds at rest and waiting, dormant yet undefeated. Desert flowers, they endure, moistened by our tears and by the rains which come to end even the longest drought. They send down roots and they bloom. May we believe in those seeds and the seeds within us. May remember in our dry seasons that we too are desert flowers. Thank you, Carol. Our next hymn is number 1019, again in our Teal Hymn book, uh, Everything Possible. Again, the text shall be coming up behind me, and for those of you online, I invite you to rise in body and spirit as, as we join in singing together, Everything Possible.
and the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. Yes, indeed. Each week we take some time to recognize the joys and sorrows, the celebrations, the concerns that touch not only our own lives, but the lives of those we love and those we care about. It's a ritual practiced by many Unitarian Universalist communities. We light candles to mark these significant moments and events in our lives. For those of you who are with us online, if you wish, you may write down your thoughts into the chat in your computer. For those of you here in the sanctuary, we do have two candle stations available on either side. And in a moment, I'll invite you forward to light a candle if you wish to do so. As you're doing that, the choir will sing. I'd like to take a moment to read a little bit of the text of the song that the choir will sing for you in a moment. May it be an evening star shines down upon you. May it be when darkness falls, your heart will be true. You walk a lonely road, oh, how far you are from home. Believe, and you will find a promise lives within you. If you, liked, if you wish to light a candle, I invite you forward now. Good morning. I'm Lynn Turvey. I'm going to read For When I Really Don't Want to Learn This by Elizabeth Nguyen. 
Spirit, <clears throat> I would really rather not learn this. Didn't think I needed to. I thought someone else could do it. Thought a leader was coming to do it. Thought the young people could do it, or the elders could do it, or the professionals. Or I don't want to learn it because it means letting go of something I hold dear. Letting go of being someone who knows the answers. Letting go of being someone who doesn't know. Letting go of the way I see the world. Letting go of how I might have to change. Letting go of certainty, of logic, of facts, of control. Of the myth that you can live on this earth and not harm. Or the myth that I can't learn anything new. Help me to learn it, please. And then, help me to live what I have learned and do right by the gift of being taught. Oh, that hits so many chords with me. <laughs> unlearning and letting go of control and oh hmm. our theme is transformation and that's a word that sounds so full of beautiful possibility i imagine butterflies emerging from cocoons and flowers coming out from buds and then if i think of its synonym change all those feelings change because then i think of discomfort and anxiety and hard work. So why is that? Any type of shift, no matter what we call it, leads to growth. So why is it so hard and why are our reactions so different depending on the word that we use? Well, I think it's how we interpret those words. And I think when we interpret who is being most impacted by the change. So if it's somebody else that's changing, our tendency is to skip over all that hard work of transformation and simply focus on the end results. We forget about all the time of being a caterpillar and all the messiness of being in the cocoon and oh, it's a butterfly, it just magically happened. However, when the change happens to us and we have to change ourselves, that hard work comes very sharply into focus and we become keenly aware and some may even say whiny about how tiring and frustrating and hard change is. What got me thinking about all of this uh, was a quote that I recalled when I was putting this service together and I started out, my undergrad ended up being in English, but it started out in economics. And uh, we were doing some readings from John Kenneth Galbraith. And he was a Canadian American economist, a diplomat, a writer, and kind of an all round cheeky, pretty witty guy. And he said, faced with the choice between changing one's mind and proving that there is no need to do so, almost everyone gets busy on the proof. So why do we fight so hard against change when we know it's inevitable? Well, I think there are several reasons. Change is hard because it breaks patterns we've established. Studies have shown, and this amazes me every time I read it, that the human brain can process 11 million bits of information every second. But our conscious minds can only handle 40 to 50 bits per second. So we rely on shortcuts, on patterns, on kind of established ways of doing things just to cut down that processing time, just so that we can cope. So when something changes, we have to change all our shortcuts. We have to make new patterns. And that's slow, hard work. Change is also hard because we're hardwired to view change as a threat. The primitive part of our brain, the amygdala, still puts us into fight, flight, or freeze mode when we experience change. And that protected us well when we were hunters and gatherers and uh, had real live four-footed sharp-toothed predators, um, but we don't need that so much anymore. Our amygdala just hasn't quite caught up to that though. But I think the biggest reason that change is hard is because it requires us to be vulnerable. 
If we're the ones changing, we risk a loss of acceptance. We can become confused, frustrated. We have doubts about our abilities to carry through with the change, and then a fear of failing. But did you know that when we know someone else who's changing, that draws out those same fears in us. It's not talked about as much, but it definitely adds to the difficulty of change, both for the person who's changing and for our own ways of being in the world, because it fuels the kind of questions that keeps us up at night. If they're changing and I'm not, does that mean I'm out of touch? Does it mean I'm not self-aware? Does it mean I'm missing something? Or if they change their mind about that thing, are they going to change their mind about me? Is our relationship in trouble? Am I going to be left behind? Or if they don't want to volunteer in that role anymore, who's going to do it? How's our organization going to survive? They've always done it. Nobody else knows how to do it like they do. Well, guess what? There's always been change. Another of my favorite quotes was from René Levesque, a politician uh, a few decades ago, and he said, graveyards are full of indispensable people. <laughs> We've all changed. Everyone around us has changed. And sometimes the changes are easy to see. They're big milestones. They're a move from a baby to a toddler, to from being single to partnered, from being healthy to ill. But sometimes the changes aren't as obvious. And those seem to be the ones that can trip us up the most. So there's a couple places that I look for guidance. First, there are gaboodles of change models. And they talk about the stages of change and change management. And they all have two things in common. First, they agree that change always causes disruption. Even when everyone agrees that the change is for the better, they still shift how we do things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a change. This takes time and can be messy, but it's necessary. Second, there are always early adopters and laggards and a whole pile of folks somewhere in the middle. And where you are on that scale shifts depending on what is changing, how quickly it's changing, and how the change has been introduced to you. So change models are well-researched, they're uh, tested, they're academic. But I have a second source that I certainly would not call academic, somewhat researched. Uh, but for me, it packs a bigger and more motivating punch. And that's personal experience. We've all been in the presence of someone who seems like they are doing exactly what they were meant to do. That they're in the place and the time that they should be. And these people are amazing to be around. They're grounded. They have a quiet confidence. They're almost incandescent with purpose. It's inspiring to be around them. Their values, their passion, their work, it all aligns. And they attract like-minded people. And isn't that what we all want for ourselves? A life of significance filled with purpose, service, and meaningful relationships. And don't we want that for everyone to experience? I think we do. So how can we create the conditions where we and others can transform into our best selves? Well, we can start by remembering that like grains of sand that make up each one of us, there are tiny seeds at rest and waiting, dormant yet undefeated, desert flowers. And even after the longest drought, they send down roots and they bloom. We can check our assumptions and pull ourselves out of the ruts of our patterns by asking good questions and being thoughtful listeners. We can ask if a person is happy. Do they feel like their values and their work and their passions are aligned? Do they want to try something new? And then we can give others and ourselves the room, time, and support 
to take steps in a new direction. We can listen, we can receive, we can affirm. Most of all, we can show people that they can be anybody they want to be, and we will love them still. Since this whole reflection started from a quote, I'm going to end it with a quote. These words are from Heather Warman, who was the executive director of the Kentucky Environmental Foundation. And she was talking about the transformation of a seed, but I think it applies equally well to people. She observed that for a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out, and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, that looks like complete destruction. Well, for me, that captures the messy, scary, hard, necessary, and ultimately beautiful work of transformation. Our masks crack, our walls come down, our dreams and our what-ifs that we've carried quietly inside bubble out, and everything changes. May we create the environment that allows every seed to transform into its full beauty. Blessed be. I invite you now into a time of meditation. If you'd like to relax so your backs are well supported in your chair, uh, if it's comfortable for you, you can cloud your gaze or close your eyes. Take a couple deep breaths. We're going to have some spoken words, a moment of silence, and then a song from Coriolis. A Formation Prayer by George Grim Howell. Spirit of the earth, Gaia, mother, we call on you. In your womb we are formed, formed and reformed, shaped and reshaped in the great cauldron of geological time, unknown and unknowable. May we in this tender moment whisper a word of gratitude that creation did not end on the sixth day, but joyously rolls on age after age, across the centuries, the years, the days, continuing now, this very moment, inside our forming and transforming hearts. To live is to change. To change is to find our sacred purpose. Father Time, teach us to love our layers, the deposits of bygone seas of joys and sorrows, that have built up the foundations of who we are. Mother of creation, teach us to be fearless as we are cast into the fires that melt and mold and harden us during times of upheaval and injustice. Spirit of the earth, teach us to trust the transformation, to hang on tight as we suffer the pressure and the heat, as our souls deep in darkness await the metamorphosis that day when, finally, we emerge from the womb of life, transformed, our dusty limestone turned to lustrous marble. May our transfigured hearts be hewn into tools that give life or works of art that inspire, or maybe a smooth, flat stone flung from a child's hand that skips on water for one sparkling moment. And when change comes again, May we be content to let the ocean waves of time gently release us as humble grains of sand to caress the toes of curious beachcombers. Let our lives be formed and reformed and transformed again for love and justice, for we know that this is holy. Amen and blessed be.
I'd like to now invite you to join me in a responsive reading in a shockingly intuitive move. I am going to be the one, and I'd ask you to be the many. And the, the words will be on the screen. Um, for the many and for the choir who can't see the screen, your response is, this is loving and being loved. To become is a lifelong process. Nothing's constant, not even the self. We evolve in the midst of narratives meant only for some and ways of being made narrow by fear and power. We must then have the courage to listen to the truth of our own lives, to the wisdom that comes from within, responding without resistance or need to control, but with welcome and curiosity. This is what ensures our becoming is an unfolding of our truest self, and this lifelong labor cannot be carried out alone. It requires help from friends and lovers and family and creaturely companions who bear witness to what makes us come alive and say to us, listen, look, feel, pay attention to that. This is loving and being loved. Telling the stories, sharing in the memories, giving thanks for the relationships, understandings and experiences past that have shaped us to this day. This is loving and being loved. Celebrating new beginnings that excite, holding risks together, leaning into unknowns with the promise of support and companionship, this is loving and being loved. Listening to the future calling uniquely to each of us in the midst of all of life's noise. Helping one another find our place in the shared labor of collective life and supporting each other in what it is the world's ache is asking from us. This is love and being loved. To say for the first time, this is who I am. This is the truth of my body. This is what I know about myself. This is my name and this is where my path is leading me. And to have it heard, have it received, have it affirmed, and then to say it again and again as we change and as the world changes and to have each proclamation greeted with an open-armed embrace, this is loving and being loved. There is no me without you. We shape one another. The sacred that birthed us weaves our lives together so that we can only find ourselves through shared becoming. For my journey and all its winding ways, for yours, for all the saints who labored for what it is, for all the kin whose lives made ours possible, for all those yet to come for whom living our truths today will mean breaking possibilities open for them tomorrow. We pause, we give thanks, we acknowledge. This is loving and being loved. Now it's the test. I hope you studied carefully. If you didn't, you've got four verses to pick it up, so you'll be good. <laughs> Joyous as we sing the newest Gordon Ritchie hymn, Come With Me.
gold stars all around. <laughs> Did a great job. We are going to end our service today with uh, extinguishing our chalice, some closing words. Coriolis will sing you a, pre or a postlude uh, and then invite you to sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. So if I could ask Lori and Dorothy to collaborate again on extinguishing our chalice. And I will read these words. In the name of all that is holy, may the connections between us inspire and sustain us. May the flame of life within us and amongst us be a sacred reminder that we are all called to serve, to grow, and to love as we continue this journey of transformation. And our closing words are by Emily Richards. May you leave this time together changed. May the promises you have made to yourself about who you want to be feel closer to the reality of who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go. May it spread into every word and deed, thought and interaction until we are all changed, transformed and transforming together becoming our better self.